Well, thanks everyone for joining our webinar today. Um, today's focus is on sort of getting started on Precision Ag, really uh, focused around the Western Downs region of Queensland today. The other workshops have been spread all over the Northern region. Um, so it's great to have some uh, local farmers from those from those areas to, to talk about their experiences and, and the differences in the geographical regions is, is uh, quite interesting. So it's been really good to have uh, a good spread of uh, presenters. So first I'd like to thank GRDC for funding these workshops. Um, they've made these five workshops available um, to grain growers and uh, industry. Um, we also are supported by FarmLink and SPA, the Society for Precision Agriculture in Australia. So I appreciate their support. Um, I guess, you know, we're, we've sort of been doing this, uh, you know, precision ag game for over 25 years. And, you know, we're really at a point now where we're seeing quite a uh, big adoption. And, and I think GRDC is conscious that we need to get really simple, hands-on sort of practical stuff out to growers to really, to, to so they can really focus on on getting started and, and, and beginning the journey uh, with, with simple tools rather than complicated solutions, which has sort of plagued the industry in the past. So hopefully we can get that across to you today. Um, this uh, webinar will be recorded and it was being recorded and will be available on Zoom as well. Uh, sorry, on uh, YouTube. So I guess going back to the basics here, why are we here? You know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And I think too often than not, we focus on technology, not necessarily on the problem. So most farmers in the room will know that the yield variability in every paddock is massive. Uh, this is a yield map below showing the variability and, and typically, you know, some areas of the paddock might be four and a half tonnes, other areas one and a half tonnes per hectare, for example. And, and I can tell you over the last 25 or 20 odd years, I've looked at hundreds and thousands of yield maps and they're all pretty much the same. Doesn't matter where you go in the country. So, and it's probably fair to say that this paddock here down the bottom, anything in red is probably losing money uh, because we're applying the same rate of inputs across all, all of those hectares. So we've got this very big efficiency gap between what's applied and, and what's causing, you know, low yielding and high yielding areas. And we're often over fertilizing uh, poor performing areas and under fertilizing other areas. Uh, that, are, that are actually growing well. And in fact, talking about the Western Downs, I did some EM uh, analysis for a client the other day out uh, near Chinchilla. And in his poorer areas that haven't grown any crop, um, he's now got upwards of 1,000 kilograms of nitrogen uh, per hectare available. So he's been putting nitrogen on for probably 30 years and the crop has not been extracting it. Um, compared to the areas where he's got good crop, you know, is down sort of 60 units of N. So there's a very, very big uh, inefficiency happening there. And we need to understand the drivers of that and try and repair that to fix that to, to really boost productivity and, and improve profitability. And I think adoption of Precision Act tools has is, is pretty, been pretty slow. And that's not the fault of the growers' willingness to do this. It's, it's really largely, it comes around to the technology not being simple enough to actually implement this in a value proposition. So I think we're at that point now where we're, we're getting there. So let's start with what's not new. I guess we're still trying to solve the same agronomic problems um, like soil constraints and fertilizer, you know, variable fertility in our soils. Um, you know, we're, our plant populations change due to soil conditions and planting conditions. We've still got weeds, pests and diseases. And often we struggle with harvest timing. Um, and so, you know, that's, those sort of problems haven't gone away. Um, like I said, we already need to be more efficient with our inputs. We're, we're, we're over fertilizing areas that aren't producing much and under fertilizing areas that are, and therefore there's a constraint on productivity and efficiency. What is changing though, is that we're getting increasing access to data. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some satellite imagery shortly where every, every farm uh, in the world has had an image over it every five days for the last five years. So that's a heck of a lot of data that you've got at your fingertips that could be used to, uh, to start down this journey. So it's now massively uh, available and there's also a huge amount of supplies coming online. So we're gonna see increasing quality and reliability and, and um, resolution 
um, coming in the, in the years ahead. We've, you know, every yield monitor, uh, sorry, every, every harvest system now got a yield monitor. We're now at about 70% adoption of, of yield monitoring. The thing is that only half the people that have got a yield monitor actually look at a yield map. So there's a big gap there and we need to fix that. Um, you know, we've got soil, soil mapping like electromagnetics is, is now commonly available. Um, topography mapping, every time your tractor runs across the paddock, you are basically collecting elevation data and, and now we're GPS referencing, hopefully most of our soil sampling. Um, so the tools are now becoming simpler to use and all of those interoperability issues that have plagued the industry for years are slowly disappearing. So, you know, can this plug into this or, you know, what files does the machine take is, is actually improving considerably. Um, also, every new machine, a reasonable size machine that's come into the country in the last 12 months is all connected to the internet. So it's going to make our life easier of transferring data. Um, so that's, that's what's changing. And I think that's a really exciting place to be. Uh, obviously, we still have major connectivity issues in the bush with uh, phone coverage, um, but that will only improve as time goes on. So let's just start with one, some of the key layers, right? Just to give you an idea, like I said at the start, we, we need to be focused on what the problem is and what, what you're actually fixing, not the technology, but it helps to know what technology is out there so that you've got some idea how you might use these things. So things like GPS reference soil testing um, is really good for understanding fertilizer requirements and soil constraints. And often you'll be targeted with that using a say satellite image, a, a yield map, um, an EM map, for example. So really important to, to GPS reference all of our soil tests going forward. And I'm, I'm, I'm more than confident to say we should never ever do uh, blended soil testing ever again. There is absolutely no, uh, I think there's, there's very little point in doing it. Uh, and it, 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 it often asks more questions than it answers. So I think we need to be targeted every time. Yes, you're gonna spend more money on soil testing. That's a given. You're gonna spend three times as much money on soil testing. However, you're gonna get 10 times the information. So I think we've got to draw a line in the sand and get away from this, you know, just a general drive across the paddock and collect samples. Um, there's been a big push for grid soil testing in the South, particularly around lime and phosphate. Um, and I think, yeah, paddock history plays a role there where often other layers like EM don't pick up those differences. But yeah, in some cases they do too. Uh, elevation mapping, like I said, it's a really good layer. It's, it, it's drainage is a major problem in the grain growing areas of Australia. It's probably one of our biggest constraints that we don't pay enough attention to, but elevation data is really important there. And as we go further north, and today we're talking about the Western Downs, the Roma region, um, then you know, soil erosion becomes a massive problem. Um, we had quite a bit of discussion yesterday about soil erosion as well um, around the Northern New South Wales region. So, you know, you can use your elevation mapping for, for, for planning your contour banks, um, drainage, all that sort of stuff. Uh, EM soil mapping, electromagnetics, it's, it's not new technology, but it, it's, it needs, it's getting much more widely adopted now in, in agriculture. Um, perfect for picking up soil types, your soil depth, you know, you might have a sand over a clay, like a duplex soil, perfect for picking up that. Um, or you might have a shallow clay over say bedrock, like we do in central Queensland. And again, it's very good for picking up that because it's detecting clay content. Uh, also potentially used for veriborate gypsum. So salts and sodium sort of go together most of the time in our environment, especially in, the, in these areas we're talking about. And uh, it's a good surrogate measure for picking up gypsum. And we'll see some great examples today of veriborate gypsum, um, which, which um, yeah, shows how, how useful that can be. Um, satellite imagery, like I mentioned, is, is now on tap, beautiful for looking at in-crop management um, and also the long-term trends, because I said there's five, every five days for the last five years, there's an image over your farm. Well, that's perfect for picking up those long-term trends. Uh, yield mapping, 80% of uh, headers now got yield mapping. Well, perfect for replacement of phosphate if, you, if you're looking at that, if you're a heavy user of phosphate trials, analyzing those trials to determine what is the return on investment from a treatment. So you're doing a fertilizer trial, you really need that yield data to actually work out your return on investment. 
your performance. Obviously, it's the ultimate measure of your crop growing performance. So therefore, it's it's a great layer for doing that. Um, and again, trends. Uh, many people have, um, you know, multiple years, fifteen years of yield data, and many much of it's a bit of a mess, right? But at least it's giving you those long term trends as well. Protein mapping, we're seeing a, a big interest in protein mapping now. You, you can't really do variable rate nitrogen unless you have protein. Um, you, you need to, to to work out crop removals. You need nitrogen times your uh, sorry. You, you need your protein times your yield times your crop factor gives you nitrogen extraction. And it's perfect for for doing that. And I'll show you some good slides on that later. Many growers are using it for blending as well um, as they go to achieve their optimal optimal protein content in their grain. And finally, I think the other important layer is obviously the machinery data. Uh, all the machines now are giving you fuel use maps. Uh, also things like record keeping, very important. And the other crazy thing is we see the impact of human behavior on our yield maps. I've seen many times where a, an operator in a planning rig will say up, the, up, up a couple of gears in the middle of the night because he's a bit bored and you can see the impact of that on the on the yield maps. So we we totally underestimate the impact of our human behaviours on on the imp, uh, on the performance of our cropping. And I think the the machinery data really does highlight those issues. Um, I will say too, if you've got any questions at any time, feel free just to um, jump in, put those into the uh, into the chat uh, or the Q and A box. Um, we're happy to answer those as we go. So. Yeah, welcome those questions. Please send them through. Just want to dig a little bit deeper into some of these things. Elevation mapping. Every time you run across your country, like I said, is you're collecting an elevation map. So this is an example from New South Wales from our first one of our first uh, workshops. One of the one of the growers there. You can. Uh, this is also from uh, lidar, which is laser scanning. You can get this data freely available now in a lot of places. Um, probably not so much on the Western Downs, there's uh, not as much um, activity been out there, but certainly you can get this sort of data where you can see, in this case, this is the, this photograph was taken along this edge. Um, you can see where the ponding is occurring here, and this is the impact in the paddock. So the grower's in there right now, actually, with a bu laser bucket uh, fixing up some of these problems. So it's a really, really good base layer. It also reflects soil types quite a bit. Um, soil, rapid soil mapping, um, there's electromagnetics has been around for a long time, but the tools we've now got make it really, really quick and easy to collect. We've now got a number of these units got, um, across the country. So we're hiring those out. And, and what that does is you can just drive this across your landscape at sort of 20 to 30 meter swaths. It measures down 1.5 meters into the soil profile. And it picks up three things. It picks up clay content, moisture content, and salt content. Now, in a non-saline soil, it's going to be detecting mostly um, your clays um, and, and the different soil types. But where you've got salt, it really does detect that quite clearly. And I guess really importantly, like all of the layers I'm talking about, you need to ground truth. And to detangle what this is actually telling you, it's very important you do that. Um, and it will, it will highlight what those issues are, but it gives you a really, really nice base layer. And we'll see some EM mapping today as well. Imagery on tap, you know, it's a great tool for looking at your production in real time. And you can see here this, the, I guess the biggest important factor to note about satellite imagery is it's picking up things that you can't see with your naked eye. Because it's working in the infrared spectrum, very, very sensitive to chlorophyll content. So whilst you're, um, you know, the bigger, the greener, the healthier the crop, the higher the number in the, in the vegetation index. And this is represented here in say like the blue areas. So on this particular day, these blue areas were the best part of that field and the red areas were the worst part of that field. Not saying it's a bad crop, just saying that's the worst part of the field on that day in terms of greenness and health. So a great little tool, it's called NDVI. It's a vegetation index commonly used um, across a lot of platforms. Um, we're also working on some cloud-free options. So obviously this relies on reflectance from the ground and you, you, you need to have cloud-free imagery. And I'll show that later on. 
multiple years stacking is now achievable either with with yield maps or, or um, with satellite data. This is an example. Uh, this this client will be talking tomorrow at a webinar tomorrow. Um, we we stacked five years of satellite data together, went and ground truth that with some soil tests. You can see the black dots here on the right. Uh, five zones that came out of this. It, it just com completely reflected in the field where the soil depth problems were. And, and we've been able to reduce rates of fertiliser in these areas um, and up them down on the flats to account for that soil, de soil depth uh, issue. So really, really simple tool to actually do that. And you can go back five, six years now. Um, we did some work with summit fertilisers in Western Australia this year where we're using the five zone uh, long-term stack product. We converted that to three zones simply to put in nitrogen response trials. So if we're gonna look at any sort of trialing, you need to understand what the variability is in the field first. And if you own your own property and you've been there a while, you, you sort of understand that. But we, for those that are in looking at uh, new properties or, or just trying to get a better handle on their um, responsiveness to different fertilizer rates, you need to make sure you're putting those through the high, medium and low parts of the field. So often I see trials put in completely the wrong spot because they don't understand the variability of the field. Um, we did some work uh, in, in Western Australia a while back and it, it turns out that not, not one trial was put in the low areas of the field. they are always put in the better parts because they wanted to see good responses, but often you get your best responses in your poorest areas. So it's really important you do that. So from those three zones, we actually put strip trials in uh, a 10 paddocks last, uh, this year. And this is, you can see the strip trial through the middle and the buffer we did around it. And this is the whole, the whole field NDVI on this particular day. <clears throat> so that's the whole paddock. You can pull the strip uh, out and the buffer. So we're comparing now, what is the strip response to what is the buffer response around it that's not treatment, not treated. And from here, we know that in fact, every one of these 10 paddocks had still needed nitrogen because we could pick up the, the nitrogen responsiveness uh, in the satellite data every five days. So really useful tool for doing trials as well. Um, I guess what we're trying to do is make this really quick and easy to, to get data and out to the machines. Um, so with the satellite data, you can get the data, zone it up into three zones really, really quickly, add your rates, um, get a file and, and go and apply that literally within five minutes, you could be doing that. So we're trying to, you know, people make these decisions quickly in response to issues that are happening. And, and the sort of tools that we're building will help get this out to the marketplace really quickly. This shows like a zone map on the screen and the zone map in the cab. Um, like I said, this year, oh, sorry, last year alone saw two and a half thousand tractors, sprays and harvesters all of them pretty much are connected to the internet now. So we can push this zone map that we created uh, on the screen in the software, push that straight to the machine. And this is it appearing in the machine. You can still obviously use the old way of a USB stick, but uh, we all of the software now pretty much operates on a shape file. And, and that's really good because now everyone's getting to a common standard, which means, you know, this makes this whole process a lot easier. So yeah, all of the, and on Friday, we're actually gonna have all the manufacturers talking about how you do this in each of their own machines. So join us on Friday, if you wanna hear, hear more about that. The yield mapping, obviously yield mapping has issues and, and Scott's gonna to talk today about some issues they've had. Often we'll see the imagery match the yield map pretty closely, not always, but most of the time you will. Um, but you know, yield maps are obviously the final performance indicator and what you get paid on. Obviously, uh, you know, also you can have things like frost where you, know, you might get a frost event that looks good in the imagery, but it is obviously a low yield in the, in the yield map. So they're the sort of things that can happen pre-harvest. And finally, I just want to finish on uh, protein mapping. It's getting a big interest in Australia right now. This is just some uh, material I, I stole off the CropScan website. Um, they, uh, they sell a, a machine, uh, Australian made, where you can get your protein map on the left here, top left. And if we look at the yield map in the middle, you can see there's a completely opposite relationship. So high yield, low protein, and vice versa. Um, like I said, you've got to combine those two things times by a crop factor to get your nitrogen removal map. And this is that here. 
And this is, you know, obviously then I would recommend ground truthing because often some of these effects might be caused by something like waterlogging, which is not a nitrogen response. So you need to check about what's causing that uh, and then go and apply your nitrogen um, based on that. So that's um, pretty much all I had to uh, cover off on just on the basics, just to get, get you sort of started. Feel free to contact us if you have any sort of uh, questions on that. Um, feel free now to, get, to keep throwing up questions in the Q&A and, um, and the chat boxes, if you like. Um, so yeah, throw those up. Um, I'm just wondering, Trent, should I, Trent, are you there, mate? Trent was still uh, joining us. He was running a bit late. So I might just. Yeah, Tim, I'm on channel there. Yeah, mate, do you, do you want to just wait or do you want to go now? I can slip over to Peter quickly. Want to get some better range and stuff. Right, I'll flip over to Peter first, and then um, um, we'll cover off on your stuff in a, when you get in a bit better coverage, mate. Um, Peter, are you right to share your screen, or do we not? Do you want me to run your session? Uh, if you can run it for me, if you wouldn't mind, it'll, just, it'll be really quick run through. So just a bit of background stuff. Right, do you want to start with a um, bit of your who you are and where you're from and what you do. Yep, thanks very much, Tim. Yeah, so um, farming between Roma and uh, Taroom. Uh, yeah, been here all my life. Uh, going way back, uh, 1983, pre-PA, but uh, actually started tram lining. It was the first precision agriculture we did, matched our planter to our um, spray or spray rig to our planter. Um, and just a, I know a lot of this everyone's just doing, but an interesting observation that happened to us about three years into that um, really simple thing, and some people may not have done it yet. Uh, got a big storm just before harvest, and so still just a bit of green in the crop. We're actually waiting for the um, two rows either side of the tram line to ripen. Everything else was pretty well right to go. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the photo to share with you, but effectively after the storm, we had a flat paddock with uh, four rows, one either side of each wheel track standing up. And a uh, simple solution to that was to throw the seed that should have gone in the tram line instead of spreading it even, evenly everywhere else across the machine, we doubled up by the side of the tram lines and cured that issue. So for anyone that hasn't, going way back to that sort of thing, hasn't done that. That's a really simple way to cure late ripening around tram line. That drawing there, um, it's just showing where, and this is going well back before there was any standardizing on how many meters wide a machine would be. Ours happened to be 14 and a half meters. Um, the pink lines there is the compaction or the tractor jewels, uh, tracks, trying to get uh, wheels and air seeders and God knows what to all line up. Mm. We just jump to the next one. Um, a typical um, photo of the sort of track that a lot of people use. Um, big jewels spread the weight. We thought we'd cured all our issues until we found all we'd done was effectively created compaction. So the inner inner tyres were on the tram line, the air seater was on that, the um, sprayer was on that, and those outer jewels mixed with the tyres on the planter were uh, effectively, uh, we had 25% of our planter width was being impacted. Uh, just jumped through, Tim, uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff's old, old hat to a lot of people, but just to give a bit of background, so you know, onto the tram lines, um, just a view and typical of our country here. It actually looks a whole lot flatter in the images, but um, I believe in what, one thing I have concern about is everyone knocking their trees out of their cultivations. Uh, we've always kept them there. I know they can be an inconvenience and 
uh, either keep operators awake at night time or cause machinery damage. But I think we've got to look at the bigger picture of uh, what we're doing to our landscapes. So um, that's that one, just next one, please, Tim. And yeah, result of the... um, that was about a uh, memory, it's not showing there in the screen, but it's nudging four tonne to the hectare dry land on some of our very best country uh, wheat crop. Uh, that's about 2016, I think, from memory. Um, so going on to the next one. Just a standard Trimble screen. Um, yeah, all just basic stuff that you know, people will have whatever version of that in their tractors these days. But obviously for anyone just starting out, it's probably the very first thing that you go into. Uh, next screen. So we've gone away from the um, duels to quad track. Um, and yeah, other than the, for the fact that tracks don't like stones, which I thought they were actually going to be better than the tyres, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't go back to tyres again. Uh, you get so much easier to sort out all your tram lining, reducing compaction, etc. Next one, please. So we've totally changed our operation here um, so and very little grain cropping at the moment and I was interested with all the yield I've always been fascinated by the satellite imagery the yield maps what we can do to the old thinking was that um, you know basically you had to bring the poor country up to the good country and obviously people have worked out that we've actually got to look at the limitations of the soil and I think it's something that we have to really seriously consider in grain cropping in general in Australia. We're busily putting a lot of inputs mm -hmm. into um, soil that um, was either never meant to be cropped or certainly never meant to be cropped for any significant length of time. And you know, we've spent many years 40 odd years of growing, uh, I spent 40 odd years of growing grain crops and got to a point where I thought I was you know, doing a pretty good job given our soil constraints, our weather constraints and whatever, and had a bit of an aha moment over the last few years, stopping and really looking at exactly what we should be doing with our soils. And this particular paddock here developed a role of crimper planter along with a well, Charlie Lang from Dolby, that's going through a um, forage sorghum crop that had had hay cut off at 12 months ago, uh, or in May, sorry, 18 months ago, and then uh, just let it come back. And in that photo was taken in about um, early January, late December, uh, ran the crimper over it, did nothing else to it at all, just ran the crimper over it. And our first, um, it was only 20 hectares. Uh, last year, we um, cut 40 big bales of hay off there on the first time round. Just creeping it, doing nothing else to it, getting some rain in January, February, running on the tram lines, etc. cetera. Um, came up with 164 big bales. No fertiliser. So that's the other thing. I also have um, considerable concerns is just the amount of fertiliser that we're trying to jam into our soils and uh, interested Tim when you made that comment about people with um, on Western Downs on some of their saltier I'll describe it or higher EC soils with a thousand units of nitrogen sitting there so I think we've got to be really aware with the whole PA thing exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it so uh, next slide yeah, it's not, hold on. There you go. It's not clicking for me. Yeah, so that's just a close up of the crimper in action. Um, a cockatoo damaged barley crop. Uh, so, yeah, just for those that are interested in seeing what it actually does. Uh, next one again, please. Yeah, I doubled up and next. Yeah, so next one. So, our, our PA here has, um, because of our major swing. We've always been in livestock, but our major swing to livestock is um, a form of 
precision agriculture the cattle were using um, AgriWeb, some of you will be aware of it. Um, and that's just an overview of part of the place and some of the infrastructure you can click on anywhere there and get down to details of water troughs, paddock areas, crop histories, grass histories, et cetera. Uh, so next one. Can I, can I just ask one quick question, Peter? Like, just to give people context about the Western Downs region, we're talking about, you know, highly variable rainfall, like you, you get these extremes and, and long duration dry spells. And then uh, often in the dry years, I reckon it rains more out west than it does in close to the coast where we are in Toowoomba. But, you know, give us some sense about your variability of your rainfall and your variability of soils, because that's what really drives your systems, isn't it? Yep. Actually, there'll be one of these images will show oh, the, uh, but no, the, the, the variability of soil. But uh, <laughs> I'll jump there. Sorry, that. mate. You're right. Go back to that other one. Um, so rainfall, uh, 20, 11, the wet years, uh, 10, 11, we had 64, I'm talking inches here, 64 inches and 60 inches. Our long-term average is 26. In 2019, we had four inches. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, and it is, I really feel we're seeing, we've always been variable, some are dominant, but highly variable. Uh, a good winter cropping year for us would be to get um, four inches of rain between planting in May and harvest in October. Uh, that's, you know, that's when we'd sort of pull those three and a half, four tonne to the hectare yields if we could get four inches, 100 mils in crop, provided oh, obviously stored the summer moisture. Um, that's pretty pretty serious water sufficiency, mate. That, that sort of breaks all the records when you're growing four tonnes on. 100 mils of in-crop rain plus probably 150 mils are stored. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's where, you know, for a long time thought we were doing really well, but start to look at the, um, you know, with the dry, so 17, 18, 19, we were 17 inches, 13 inches, four inches. Um, you know, it just, I mean, we've got trees, trees have died, big low suckers have died. I mean, that's proper dry. Uh, even this year, we've only planted very little bit of uh, winter crop and it hasn't come to anything much. You don't have to travel too far from here to the south of us and they've had a reasonable winter season and even to the east of us. But that's, you know, I think we all need to realise that um, that variability is just going to get greater and greater. Um, soil variability... You know, I look at some of these imagery of country on the downs or even down around Gundy or some of the, what we deem better areas and um, you know, dream of the fact that you could have a paddock that's probably got two or three different soil types. I reckon we can have two or three different soil types in 100 metres, but our good soils are really good and our poor soils are, are poor. And we've tended to... Um, and this has come through the iometer before we had the good PA stuff and then with our onboard yield monitors and just recording tended to zone, uh, zone our farming. And in 1993 and 94, we had two one in 100 year frosts two years in a row. Uh, and that basically those, that second year or the two years we lost about a third of our winter grain crop and a result of that and mapping that with a GPS on the four-wheeler, um, we stopped, We literally just stopped growing winter grains in the lower country. I was able to map the frost yep. in this day and age. You know, yep. Satellites, all sorts of things will do it. So um, yeah, we have been playing around the edge of PA for a long time. So just on to the uh, next one. So this... For those of you that have got grazing as well, and when I talk about the PA, you can see things there like in the middle of the screen, feed on offer, uh, grazing days remaining. We've been heavily involved with, um, so Phil Tickle from SIBO Labs provides the data that, uh, the satellite data that goes into uh, AgriWeb, and we've done a lot of the huge amount of the ground truth, truthing for this region, but also particularly around buffalo grass. And an interesting thing, I think we all need to be aware of any 
remote sensing precision agriculture side of things. And Tim, you mentioned ground tracing a few times. Um, one issue we were finding with our, on our better, heavier country, when we get down to about 1.2 tonne to the hectare um, uh, yeah, left, we'd start to see an increase. We'd, yeah, if you got down to it, well, what we were physically measuring as a tonne was showing up as 1.5 tonne to the hectare, and we're getting soil colour issues coming through. So there's been, yeah, that's constantly being worked on, but just be very aware of the fact that, um, and Tim, you'll no doubt speak to this, but the satellite data has, it's getting much, much better, but we've still got some uh, fine tuning of the ground tracing to go. So just on to the next one. So that's a uh, straight NDVI of here a um, couple of days ago. I'm not sure if the date's there, but and Tim's saying that's every five days. And when we get this great, and we've got a whole series of imagery we can get, you look at that and it's basically, other than where the green is, which is timbered country, looks pretty um, depressing. We just go on to the next one. So this is, and I, just can't remember, Tim, you'll know this one. This is a different imagery, but it's, um, if you look at that um, legend down the bottom corner, you've got non-green as blue, green as green, and red as bare. Very different story. Um, and, and then all the combinations in between. So we need to be very aware of what you're actually looking at and what you're asking for in the satellite data. Um, what we're just on the sort of more precision side of things, so a couple of things here, we talked before about the machine, you know, our tractors have all got the live to internet connection and interesting to see what people do and don't do when you're not home and you can see it live. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, likes of this AgriWeb, it's like we anyone working with us here has a copy of it on their phone and they can actually see you know, the blue dot follows them around so they can see if someone new, they can see where they are on the farm. And we're just about to start trialing um, GPS ear tags on a mob of cattle that we've gone on a walk over way trial. And everyone will be saying, what's this got to do with precision ag in a cropping sense? Uh, probably not a lot, but some time ago, when um, I was at a precision ag conference and talked about the fact that we've actually got live, once we've got livestock connected, live access to where they're going, we've got another whole lot of um, data collection and livestock have got a really good natural method of working out where the good grass, the good country, the good soil or whatever is. And I think the data that we're going to be able to start getting out of that will um, certainly interplay with um, some of their cropping side of things. So um, yep. those, those of you that were expecting to see a whole lot of uh, fantastic PA um, things of, and putting all sorts of uh, variable rate, whatever, uh, sorry to disappoint you, but... Uh, We've got variable rate feeding, yeah. variable rate grazing. They work it out yeah. themselves. So, I mean, and just on that, one of the things, so I've, I did agricultural engineering decades ago and uh, three of us got together, 45 years ago or something, three of us got together and were given this assignment um, to look 30 years into the future and the three of us came up with this wild idea of having um, no fences, having cattle controlled by something that would stop them and here we've got <laughs> GPS collars. We were going to have driverless <laughs> tractors. We had all the whiz bangery, and you know, here it's becoming a reality. But that um, controlled grazing, I mean, there is that potential with once we get the collars or you know the GPS control of livestock sorted. There's a whole lot of really good stuff that I can see that we can integrate into our cropping country. And just as a closing, I've come the full circle on livestock and crops. So my father was always uh, 
much to my annoyance, was always wanting to put cattle straight onto cultivations after harvest and leave them on too long and all the rest of it. And I actually went through a period which a lot of croppers go through uh, and some are still stuck in that um, grain cropping and livestock are two totally separate enterprises entities. don't ever mix them, um, a really important um, cycle by uh, not allowing cattle into our uh, cultivation system. So uh, for those of you that have no fences, don't worry, GPS will sort that out, GPS collars will sort that out shortly. But um, yeah, I think people need to be really mindful of looking at what their country's meant to do rather than what we as humans think we should be making it do. And I'll leave it at that. That's excellent, Peter. Yeah, spot on. And I I mean, should remind people that 70% of all uh, croppers in Australia actually run livestock. So it's not like it's an odd thing to run livestock and cropping in Australia. And in fact, the vast majority do run both. So it is a fine balancing act. And, and I guess the more you go west and north, uh, the more... It, it, the, the mixed systems are reliant on that uh, sort of interaction, but they can also do a lot of damage to cropping land. So yeah, um, they need to be treated respectfully in each, each of the areas. But I think that the technology increase in grazing is increasing quicker than, you know, we, we've been through this rapid phase in, in, in grain cropping. And, and now I, I guess, um, you know, animal livestock systems are, are catching up. Um, if there's any questions, throw them into the, into the chat box and uh, Peter will be more than happy to answer them. So yeah, type any question you like any time. We've had a couple questions about the, the cost of some of this uh, activities. Um, so, you know, some of this data is obviously free, um, different programs have different charging amounts. Um, yeah, so we can probably won't go into too much detail now about that, but there is, yeah, there's quite a bit of data available for free as well. Um, so I'll just flip over to Trent. Um, I'll run your slides, obviously. I'll just ask a quick question, Tim. Okay, of, um, mate, yep. Of Peter. Peter, sorry, you, you broke up there a little while. It must be my connection. But did you say um, your, some of your cattle end up on your cultivation or you do treat them as completely separate areas? Uh, so we went through a period where cattle were banned and now... Yeah. Um, yeah, something's wrong if we're not putting cattle on a, a significant amount of, yeah, I mean, a managed amount of the time, but um, yeah, it's we've very much come back to utilising cattle in there. And, and a good example is um, this summer just gone where it's been in, well, yeah, 12, nearly 12 months ago now, incredibly dry. And the rate that we've been, what we've been earning from adjustment on cattle on, it's actually our very best wheat paddock. Uh, we would have needed to have averaged 3.6 tonne to the hectare, $300 a tonne on farm. Wow. To equal what we've earned off cattle eating stuff, we normally spend a fortune killing. And the cultivation has got perfect ground cover at the moment, is as dry as can be, but, um, so it's where, yeah, I think we've got to really carefully rethink our know, separation of cropping and uh, livestock. Do you um, anticipate being able to use any of the information that you're hopefully going to gather with these ear tags and your cattle around, as you say, you know, cattle will hopefully identify for you or they will identify the, the better areas through their, their interest in, in feeding in that particular part of the paddock. Do you think there'll be um, layers around compaction and its its uh, impact on your next crop um, that you might be able to get out of these cattle movements, or you, you're trying to manage the cattle obviously as best you can in terms of wet weather and dry weather, so that they're not going to be on there when they're going to be compacting the ground. Yes, yeah, so we've we've always ensured um, that there's a paddock right next door to a cultivation paddock for cattle to be moved onto. And sometimes we've moved cattle sooner than we need. You, know, you move them and it doesn't rain. So we've um, got, but uh, we do all our mustering on um, four wheelers. So one of the things, our sloping country here 
really dislike motorbikes on cultivation country because unless you follow tram lines or you know, we've got very specific layout of how we physically farm the country, motorbikes are, you think cattle are bad making cattle pads, motorbikes are worse for creating that first burrow to um, mm. yeah, create erosion, water erosion issues. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks very much for sharing your experiences, Peter. It's uh, very much appreciated and it's uh, good to see uh, your journey and the, the whole cycle and that you you're a, you have a crystal ball, which is good. So that's uh, <laughs> be able to predict the future. That's good. Um, I'd like to... I don't know about predicting too much, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it's finally come to reality, which is really exciting. And, and some of the stuff that Swarm Farm have been doing, it really excites me that we're actually, yeah, really starting to make this stuff happen now. It's beyond a, it's beyond a thought pattern. So, yeah, it's good. Uh, I'd like to introduce Trent Heinemann. Uh, Trent's joining us from the comfort of his Prado by the looks of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, out in the field, mate, thanks for joining us. And... Um, yeah, give it, give us a bit of background of who you are, where you come from, and and um, and then we'll hook into your presentation. Thanks, Tim. Can you hear me okay? Is that right? Yeah, it's a bit stuttery, but um, yeah, see how you go. Try that. Is that a bit better? Yep. Yeah, no. Thanks, Tim, for the opportunity to uh, present this data farming uh, example we've done on on uh, Cypress Downs at Yulba. So I farm approximately 1,300 hectares on the Western Downs and two areas is north of Yulbar and also just uh, at Jalaka, there's two, there's two farms that we, we operate. But, um, I use contract with that size of cultivation. I've weaned myself off owning my own machinery and I've just gone to nearly a full contractor model now with the neighbours at uh, Yulbar. Um, help with operations throughout the year. And then there's a, uh, that's been to me pastoral. And then also use Guy Matthews from, from Chinchilla for, and Brad Parton from Chinchilla. They, they both do um, planting or harvesting or, you know, do basically give a full service on, a, on, on farm operations. So I'm an absent, I actually live in Brisbane. So I'm an absent, I'm technically, I like Tim the other day. They, there was you said that um, farming on the Western Downs is a hobby, and I'd probably agree with you on that. At times, it's an expensive hobby, or so it's um, live in Brisbane and using some remote. I think it's that absentee word is, um, but precision egg and some of this satellite stuff allows you to be present, um, looking at looking at where your crop is and how you're managing it throughout the year. So. I've got a background in agronomy as a, a broad acre agronomer. So a lot of the time people say to me, how do you run your farm when you when you live in Brisbane? So all these tools, you know, smartphones and um, satellites all let you be in the paddock really. So that's 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 been a good journey from um, where, where we how we used to do farming, you had to be in the paddock. So is that still okay, Tim? It's coming up a bit unstable. My internet connection is that? Yeah, it's it's a bit. Um, you can probably turn your video off now. That, now that we've got that background, so that might help. Um, it, it came through fine, mate. Gotcha. It's just a little bit breaking up a little bit, but yeah, just yeah, maybe shut the video down now. Yeah, that might. How's that? Is that a bit better now? Yeah, I think it'll come online. It's our fantastic uh, coverage across our nation. <laughs> no, I'm about I'm about 15 k's out of Dolby, so there you go. Oh, um, sorry, yeah, yeah. So Tim, I'll just um, with this particular, I just this particular paddock here, we're looking at um, yeah, I'll just on the I'll left just, we call it bull. Yep, I'll, I'll zoom in as you go around, mate. Yeah, so that that paddock, you put the pointer down. Yeah, that's what we call bull ring paddock. So this paddock here. We're uh, sort of, a, a, I think about these uh, these paddocks and I've got a real focus on below the ground at the moment, like subsoil constraints and nutrition that this paddock's been farmed with winter cereals, 
a lot of a lot of oats crops, a lot of um, winter cereals. You know, fifty years of of cultivation here, or longer. And back in, um, it just so happened that just Tim, I, I asked him to come out. We were doing some on this property. Is about five k's of, of gas pipeline running through it. And I was investigating some subsoil and topsoil mixing by the pipeline contractor. And we used the um, SWAT box that we did an EM38 on this pipeline. And that's a separate matter, but that's, that's ongoing, that work. But at, whilst we were doing that, I said, Tim, let's go and do bull ring paddock and we'll do an EM38 over it. We bashed across that paddock after harvest and we generated a, um, an EM38 map. I'll just jump to that now, mate. That that was the um, the map, and that was up in the north northeast corner. We is very sodic soil. We've got some. You, you, this is this is Brigalow Balar country. More Brigalow this paddock than Balar. It's um, it's it's sedicity is an issue there on the surface crusting on you, and it's never really grown a lot of dry matter, poor yields, and it's been quite problematic. And I knew that the um, the early gypsum work was. I needed to put gypsum on this country because it's um, a heavy clay. It um, even the paddock to the north of it. It's it was only ever um, lighter countries. So that was that was the goal. Well, just to get an EM thirty eight to to look at um, um, then matching it up to some NVDI work was what we did with Tim. We I said sure, yeah. let's. I'll Jump over that now, mate. So this is the NDVI year prior to, prior to any any application. Yeah. So just jump back before this. Um, that's so that's that's September 2020. In um in 19, we'd actually gone in and deep ripped um, fertilizer, NP, um, phosphorus and potassium into it. I've been always wanting to do um, you know, with the research and what's happening with um stratification of phosphorus. And we'd always been born it, putting, you know, 20 years of putting on starter fertilizer. It was all, I knew that we had to, it was a bit of a no brainer that we had to go and deep, um, load some phosphorus at depth. And also in 19, when we did this, it was um, um, a very dry profile and we had it, the, the ripping, it was TTQ, one of their deep rippers and Guy Matthews from Chinjilla, he put on 180 kilos of, you know, this what seems to be the standard now of phosphorus and potassium map and mop together. So we, we put that in at 30 centimetres and it's ideal ripping conditions. Like if I think if there was a label on, on deep ripping, it, it, it should say, you know, similar to a chemical label, do not, do not deep rip when it's wet because we're wanting that shattering effect. And I was very happy with the shattering effect. We loaded this soil up with 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 P and K, and then 2020 that NVDI map, Tim. If you jump to that, that was probably the best wheat crop I've grown there for a long time. If um, and I, I put it down to the the deep rip and the the P, and um, it it there's that's 80 hectares that paddock, and it I think it was doing, uh, you know, it's two and a half tonne of the hectare in that paddock, so that was to put it into context around its poor performance before. That was a, that was a very good crop out of there, but that um, NDVI is showing up. There's still, there's still work to be done in that. And that matched up to the EM38. There's a good, you, you can talk about that, Tim, if you'd like to, that the correlation yeah. between those two. Yeah, you, well, you can sort of see them on the left-hand side there. I know it's a bit hard to see, or maybe on a small screen, but. There's obviously good good linkages between what we see in the soil types and what what the crop was showing back in 2020. So yeah, a pretty pretty good uh, correlation there. So that's when we jumped across to the zoning. Do you want to jump onto that now? Yeah, sure. So just just back on that, Tim. I mean, yep. if you're in the paddock and, and you grab that soil in your hand up at the up in the where, where the it's sodic, it's sort of you nearly skin your knuckles if. If you pick that that dirt up, it's very, you know, it lacked a lot of a lot of tilt on, on the top. It was just, it was hard, you know, hard sodic clay that needed needed something done to it. So that was 
than the zoning, we'd actually finished harvest on 2020. And, we, and I said, it was just one of those decisions. I said, I'm going to order some gypsum and we're going to have a crack at this to fix up this soil with gypsum applied post harvest on, um, on, the, on the harvested, um, you know, we had a good layer of, of dry matter there, leftover harvest material. So it was just, the idea was, and it was cracked wide open. So it was then the gypsum application in October, uh, November, 2020. Um, Tim's and I was, I was in Brisbane at the time up and it was a matter of 15 minutes and he's done the zoning for me because I wasn't using the data farming platform at this stage. I was aware of it, but I wasn't using it. And again, Tim, Tim's just done that for me straight away, 15 minutes to get that, that zonal map. And we agreed on the, um, on the gypsum rate. So the yeah, 3.8. That's, that's the rates right there. Yep. Three, we sort of just, we had so much gypsum to go over 80 hectares and yeah, 3.8 and then 2.5 and 1.7 ton on the, on the areas. So the, the, way we, the way we had this process is that, I think you said, you know, we've got a certain amount of tons of gypsum, um, you know, try and balance out the rates so I can just spread it out to the exact kilo. And that's pretty much what we did. We just fiddle around with the rates because in the, we took this zone map off that NDVI image, basically took the image, created the zone map, fiddle around with the rates and on our platform, it just tells you how many tons you're going to use. Trent, I think you said, oh, I've got whatever, how many tons you had. Um, and we've so just two, balanced- 200 ton, I think there. 200 so, tons, right? So yeah, we just balance yeah. it around until we got that right. right, And that's what the, that's why it's got 1700 in the green or two and a half tons in the yellow and 3.8 tons in the red. And I, I guess, do you want to talk about this being in the, this is in the machine. This is actually the, yeah the right controller well again sitting at my desk in Brisbane, and i got and then i've then i've sent we've sent this file to the contractor which was um bs spreading from chinchilla and with their truck and their loader they've put that um that that map into the machine and away they've gone and started spreading so i was it's pretty neat that you know talk to tim 15 minutes email the file to the spreader driver and he puts it in the puts it into his um, variable rate applicator on the truck and away it goes. So, and, that, and then I, I was phoning the contractor at the time and he had his head out the window. He said, oh, you know, I know when I'm putting out 3.8 ton, ton because the motor, the machine's working very hard and he'd go out of the zone and go back into the 1.7. So that was, you know, validating that, you know, that, that that's what was happening in the paddock. And that's, that's a shot there of, up the top of that paddock, that would be where nearly where that three point eight tons going out on on onto the stubble. Any so, any questions? Feel free to throw them into the chat. So the other the other good thing that was happening there was just about the timing of it. You know, cracks in the ground. Um, we put it, you know, the trucks going out on a, a dry. We're getting no compaction. Another activity with no compaction on the on the on the, you know, keeping machine doing an operation when it's dry. The top the topsoil, and then the goal here we were going to we're going to run back into a double crop sorghum scenario here. It was I really wanted to see how the gypsum would perform in a double crop scenario. So we had 120 hectare, 180 hectares of gypsum work down there and another 120 hectares below it, which was just double cropping into the same scenario. And the um, photo up on the left there is since just we're basically, some of the philosophy around double cropping now I've got is now that so we've eliminated all our grass grass weeds out of our, our cultivations with flame. We've this this country's had three years of flame, so we've really got rid of feather top. We've got rid of barnyard grass. So with the IT sorghum, it was it was a it's probably not the best variety and to grow in that that western area. But of we went in post gypsum. We went in with um, flame 100 mil of flame. Um, 
in Mazapik, and then we we had a liter of jewel and a liter a kg of atrazine. So we basically after the gypsum we put a, a residual mix on that was going to take out all the take out all the weeds that we're going to grow in through the through the summer period, and then we planted sorghum about the 16th of January. It was a little bit late, but it uh, didn't stop raining really for the whole of the summer then. So we had, you know, above average, probably January, February, March, April, it, it had a great run through and the yield there, it was, um, it was a standout. It went for uh, just about four tonne of the hectare, the sorghum on running through from, you know, for a double crop scenario. And the, um, it also had 200 kilos of urea spread on it through that time. So, and I walked through some of those paddocks and I couldn't find a weed. It was only sorghum and it was, you know, the, the and the tilth of the soil, the gypsum worked pretty well straight away. It went from, like I was describing a hard type soil to the gypsum was activated and had a, had a, had a great run through to harvest. And it, um, it out yielded the non gypsum country. There was that 120 hectares below it, which was probably better soil. It's more of a lar type soil. So we've just taken a, you know, we've taken a pretty run down sort of Brigolo, Brigolo soil and done some deep ripping gypsum. And, the, and then some of those, that, is that the current NVDI map from the sorghum then? Is it Tim, you've got there from? Sorry, I just don't need, um, yeah, you can see. Yes, that is, and that's the sorghum mid crop. You can just see how much less variability there is because of that variable treatment that you've done. Um, and then that's what we're trying to achieve here, right? Is to try and even up these paddocks to get them to perform more evenly. Absolutely. The, um, the top end of that paddock, the northern end of that paddock, it, it just, and the rainfall we had, it was, you know, that sorghum was just, it's the best I've ever grown in sorghum. It just, everything came together there, you know, from agronomy plus also the rain, the, you know, a very good summer crop on it. I mean, summer season. So some sort of, you look at that paddock, you see that yellow line through the middle of it. That's, that's, a, that's a contour bank that runs through the middle of it. And I see that there's some on the other, you know, a lot of Western Downs countries got contour banks in it too you know historically from erosion managing erosion under our old farming system so those sort of end nvdi says i oh, you know i'd probably attack that with some maybe spread some manure along it and really work 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 hard at it to to even that up that was one of one of the things i you know post-mortem on looking at these these maps is just even narrow down more narrow down on your decision making into these areas where you can and the yellow area over to the western side there, Tim, that sort of, that area there was, we had 10 or oh, eight inches of rain in one night, talking earlier about extreme rainfall events. That that was actually some erosion that started to occur there. And it took, and the water runs into that dam to the, you know, the north, the west, it, the water runs down that way. Yep. So that that needs some re repair work done to it, but it, um, it just it just allows you to say oh let, let's get you know I might get some feedlot manure and do ten ton along that right again being just target those two areas to try and even the paddock up and put and you know we've gone in here and put more we've done de another deep ripping operation on this um on on this country we've put we've loaded up again with two hundred kilos of P and K and. That whole summer crop scenario, it's it delivered 760 tonne of sorghum delivered to, to Dolby sort of around that $300 price. That was enough incentive to go keep going um, in in growing sorghum. It um, you know as I said earlier, it's a lot, lot of history of winter cropping sorghum with that IT sorghum. Maybe I'll just go back to a, a normal sorghum this year and. Um, you know, another variety and it allows you just to keep keep um, punching yield out of this 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 country so that was a, some of the thinking around some some you know the future plans for these paddocks cool 
Any and, any questions for Trent? Any more, Trent? Oh, Tim, the, the other, the only other thing, those paddocks below it, I, I've ordered more gypsum. To, I just that they had gypsum probably five years ago. Um, that's something I'm I'm going to try and replicate the same scenario. Put I just felt there was a difference between gypsum post, you know, that double cropping scenario. I just there was something going on there. We had some herbicide damage from metsulfurin in the two paddocks below it. I think. It, it created this the sorghum just to not mature as quick as the as the bullring paddock, the one one we've tested, and it's just yeah. suspicious on that. But I still think there's the gypsum, that calcium and sulfur, just um, and plus the nitrogen. It felt there was there was a um, there was a bit of a boost there. You know, nearly got a ton to the hectare more out of that bullring paddock, and whether it was deep deep in that wasn't utilised down, and the you know the roots got would have got down way into that. Um, the bucket, you know, the clay bucket down the bottom, the nitrogen and, and more moisture, but that that we've had a wet winter, so that ground's it's three quarters full at the moment. It just doesn't need much to go again, really. Mm. That's yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think you're going to get a combination effect, aren't you? You're going to get a, a ripping release effect of some nitrogen. You're putting your DP down anyway, and your potassium, like you say. You get your soil structure sorted out with a bit of gypsum uh, and and hopefully you're getting better water infiltration, better usage of that water as well when it comes to these dry finishes. You know, they were, some of the judges were saying it's as good as the downs out there, but, <laughs> you know, it takes a bit of work to, um, and a bit of money. You know, that deep, the DPs, you know, if you're spending $100 an acre on DP and just in the fertilizer and then another, Using a contract, you might, you know, thirty thirty dollars plus diesel, and then a hundred dollars an acre on on gypsum. You know, it's all it's a worthwhile investment these days on on land values, and yeah. to see those results, it's you know, it's, it's you got to shut your eyes and spend the money, and then and hopefully everything goes to plan, and you you come out come out the other end okay. That's one of the questions. Is you know, there's do do you do you accept the soil limitations or do you try and fix them? And it's a very good question because um, my opinion is that in the first instance, we try and fix them because it is worth doing uh, from a variability point of view and productive soils point of view. But where we have limitations, you're not going to fix like soil depth, like um, the guy we're going to talk about tomorrow, or was talking tomorrow, then we just wind back the rates because you're not going to fix a 50 centimetre deep soil profile. It's, it's 50 centimetres, that's what it is. Um, you know, it's not going to perform like an 80 centimetre, 100 centimetre deep soil profile. But, you know, um, and, and re, realign your fertilisers to the high production areas of the field. So you might not save any fertiliser at all, um, but you, you actually uh, are trying to get the most out of the bang for your buck. Um, Peter, you got a comment on that? Yeah, just a question, just to clarify, um, Trent, you're talking dollars per acre there, which I did a few quick numbers. It's a huge amount per hectare. Um, what length of time do you see or do you hope that you know, this treatment will effectively, to me, you're trying to get it back to what the country was like when we first started farming it. And I look at what we've done in 20 to 40 years of farming this Big Lake country. Um, you, know, you hope to get five years, three years, 20 years. Peter, I, th I think that um, the the shattering effect that's that's a great spend. That's you know we used to cultivate for weeds, and it used to smear the the clays on that surface, that layer of compaction on the surface, and also the 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 tr um, compaction. You, you the cost of the contractor doing that with the smashing operation, it fits. Uh, Thirty dollars an acre. That's that's a good investment, I think. But at the same time, I see people deep ripping but not putting fertilizer on. And then, okay, I started. I've, I've done some at three hundred kilos of that blend at eight hundred dollars. It's a thousand dollars today, but three hundred at eight hundred is two hundred and forty a hectare. With hundred dollars an acre, oh, you know, for fifty years of um, no, you know, fifty years of not doing that, 
to do it now, I think it's again a great investment. It's a bit of a no-brainer. Let's we're just fixing that up and replacing the, the P and the K. That, and the P probably wasn't there either. So, and that's then allowing us to deep, the roots are getting down in that deep. You know, they're going to a meter and grabbing. I don't know what's going on down there, but it's obviously um, we're we're mine. You know, we're we're, get, we're accessing those nutrients deeper down, and the plants having a better time throughout the, you know, that, that summer season. So that, that whole cost, I just, you know, I just book it up with Institec and they give nine, nine months finance, you know, and worry about it in nine months. <laughs> so, it's, so pay, pay after pay, whatever you want to call it, fertilizer. <laughs> it's, um, but, but then when it comes around to paying the bill, the, the, you know the grains there. That's it's just a bit of a it's a it's a it's a bit of a crazy way to farm. But that's that's I think it's a um it's work this year anyway. Very good. Well, thanks, thanks, mate, for sharing your experience. Um, yeah, I was super super impressed with what we achieved there in a short time. Um, obviously, there's. Yeah, it's a uh, challenging environment to try and make, you know, these decisions on, but um, hopefully that gives you some, yeah, confidence to keep 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 going forwards. And um, yeah, there's there's certainly a lot lot tied up in it, but uh, hopefully we're seeing the results as, at, from all that work. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Tim, I reckon plug your uh, your data farming. I, I was, you know, I'd encourage everyone to get in there and. I was a bit hesitant about it. I didn't know how to use it. And then when I got in there and I started looking at the NVDI and the cloud, I, I just, you started drawing the paddocks in. I, I don't know how, how, how much adoption out there is on that, but it's a really easy tool. And it's everyone's, every farmer is ground truth. You know, that's the thing about it. I just, it's, um, I, it's a very neat way to make decisions. So that's, congratulations for your product where it is at the moment you know so mm. yeah thanks man i'm mean, trying to just to get people started on the journey and then then the rest follows it's my my philosophy and that's why the we've made the platform free in the first place is that people don't know it's try before you buy you don't you don't know what you don't know so you've got to experiment and the only way to experiment is to take away the barriers and that's what we've tried to do and um, we're just about to tick over twenty five thousand farms um using the platform hopefully next week. So we're getting still getting about a hundred something farms signing up a week. So, you know, like it's, I think that it's a kickstart that thinking process. Once you start to see it differently, then the rest will follow is, is our philosophy. So yeah, appreciate that. We're trying to, that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah. Um, and I'll give a bit of a demo on that right at the end, but uh, next I just, um, unfortunately, Scott Scotty Lufton couldn't be with us today. He's, it's it's crazy busy time on the farm at the moment, so he's just done a quick video for us. Um, and so I'll just get that wired up for us now. Hopefully, this works okay. Um, can everyone? Can you see that, Christian? Now, mm -hmm. right. right. I'll just hit play. Just uh, Scott's just done a quick video of his crop. Uh, that, yes. Uh, yesterday afternoon. Morning all, Scott Lufnan from uh, Muckadilla. Tim's asked me to do a quick, um, quick webinar, quick, quick overview of what we're up to out here uh, in terms of data and variable rate and things. Um, so I suppose quickly our journey started in 2013, before that, we were using Auto Farm GPS and basically just driving straight lines, and that was that was the start of it. Um, 2013, we bought our first self-propelled, went to John Deere Guidance, and in that wrapped into uh, recording everything from planting rates to yields, application rates, products, weather conditions, so on and so forth. Uh, since then, we've updated our seed cart and it's hydraulic drive, capable of um, variable rate. Um, we haven't yet used variable rate for anything other than running in some trial plots and things. Uh, have been using data farming platform quite a bit for ground truthing trials. 
um, early early observation of trials um, and ground truthing some yield data or, or double checking against yield maps, soil types, etc. I suppose our plan going forward will, um, on some of this more sodic country over here, we'll be mucking around with a bit of gypsum and, and things like that. Um, but at the moment, yeah, we're just putting zones together and, and trying to work out a cost-effective plan going forward. Uh, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, I'm sure Tim's got my contact details. Uh, yeah, yield data out of headers. We're keeping yield data, but you've always got variabilities between headers. As Tim and I were discussing yesterday, there's um, problems with yield mapping is a linear curve. So you use the correction that all the companies have. It's a straight line correction, whereas your yield, your yield mapping in headers is a linear curve. So you correct it for the average and you'll increase and decrease the higher and low, lower area variabilities. So not a perfect scenario. We're gonna muck around with some load cells and try and get our yield mapping uh, between headers more accurate. Uh, just trying to think if there's anything more I can tell you. Um, yeah, the data farming platform, there's a few NDVIs out there. Agronomist uses a different platform, but we're using um, data farming and find it easy to use. We sent through all our shape files to Tim and uh, all, our, all our field boundaries are, are preloaded. So we can dial in there. Um, it's also quite interesting to look at the NDVI regional maps and um, see where your crop's sitting. I sort of I sort of call it bulk density, but an NDVI reading versus versus neighbouring crops, different planting dates, even from field to field on your own place. Um, yeah, alrighty. Hope you enjoy. Tim's information today and um, yeah as I said give me a call if there's any more information you need Major on mute sorry um, yeah I just want to clarify thanks to Scott for that um, Prezzo um, just want to clarify one little thing there about yield monitors. There's a sort of, uh, I guess, a misconception that if you have two different monitors in the field, you just take the average and lift one up to meet the other. Uh, it doesn't, it, it sort of works most cases like that, but it's, it doesn't really ring true because when you get the highs and low production uh, sort of yielding areas, the response curves are different. It's, it's actually not a straight line relationship. It's actually a curve. So you need to consider uh, adjusting it for each part of the field, which gets very, very complicated. So I guess, Christian, you can make a comment on this. The easiest way is to actually get it calibrated properly in the first place, each header. But do you want to make some comments on that? Because it's not as easy to fix as what people think in the end. Yeah, you do see that a lot, no, not just with different colored machines, but uh, different aged machines and just machines that are calibrated and, and not calibrated. The newer machines come with load cells, as Scott was talking about, that uh, um, are auto calibrating all the time. Uh, the older ones rely on on you setting up for the right crop and, and going through the, the calibration process, which can be a bit time consuming and um, plenty of times people are in um, are keen to get crop off and that's something that they don't generally worry about. Um, so yeah and, and we saw an example yesterday where we had three headers in a paddock. Uh, we came up with a yield map that was very stripy because one of the headers was doing one and a half tons per hectare instead of two and a half, 2.6, which the other two were reporting. So there were tools around for a very um, quick way of getting rid of that striping where you match the, the header that you think has got the best setup and is calibrated the best, you match the other headers to that, um, which 
gives you some uniformity and gets rid of that striping. And I suppose it helps identify the trends across the pack. But as Tim says, it's not a, it, it's a, it's a curve. So you're, you're kind of bumping up every area across the paddock, which uh, by the same rate, which is not necessarily what occurs throughout the paddock. Cool. Um, just to finish off on, I just want to just give a quick demo of, of the uh, data farming platform to, for those that haven't made this step yet and just want to get some, you know, free data to have a look at, then um, I think it's a, it's a great place to start. Um, so you can, I'm just sharing my screen now. Uh, this is, you can either log in to uh, just directly to maps.datafarming.com.au or there's a big green button on the website. Um, if you're coming in for the first time, it'll ask you to sign up or log in. Um, so I've already signed up, obviously. So all you need to log, um, to sign up is a, just an email and you create your own password. Um, once you click into the, the platform, you can start adding farms. And um, this will take a little bit longer as we're screen sharing, but this is all my, uh, all my farms listed here. You can simply add a farm. And once you've done that, you can either, um, here's one down here somewhere where it's, you can upload the shape file. So if you're getting that out of another, another uh, piece of software or you're getting it from Google Earth or AgWorld or Backpaddock or somewhere else, you can bring that in or you can just sit there and draw your own regardless. Um, just a simple, very, very simple drawing tool built into the software just to click around and draw a paddock. Um, you can also share your farm. Say you've got an agronomist and you want to share it with them. You just click there and um, it will it will share share that uh, farm with others other, other registered users. Um, this one's been shared with me, and I can just quickly go in and view that as a as a demo property. Um, you'll see all your field boundaries come in um, when you when they're all preloaded. As soon as you click on a on a paddock all of the available satellite data pops up. So uh, you can see here, this the last image on this paddock was three days ago. It had 52% cloud, so not real flash. Um, and if I just check this cloud button here from the 5th of September, it said it had 58% cloud. You've got to be really careful that you don't have any images that have got cloud or cloud shadow on them. Uh, that will disrupt the NDVI readings considerably. And this obviously you can see here, the red is auto detecting cloud and it doesn't do a hundred percent job. So that's why we've put this little button on here to actually uh, to do that. Uh, this image here is, uh, is is free from cloud. So you can just, you can see that just the normal red, red, green, blue image from that day, just by clicking that cloud button anyway. And that's coming through there now. So that gives you a bit of an idea. Um, Scott talked about the NDVI uh, it's just the vegetation index on a regional wide basis. So you can have a look at your farm in relation to all your neighbors, check out your neighbors crops. Um, and also anything black on here turn is actually water. So you can see the, the, the index is from zero to one. Anything above 0.2 is generally crop up to a 0.85 is, is about the maximum you're gonna see. So now if we look at that same image on the same, on that day, uh, if I click the NDVI button now for that date, it's it's going away and it's clipping it's clipping that image uh, to that field boundary and stretching the colours appropriately. Now the reason we do that is because we want you when you're sampling this field, you want to go to the highest and lowest areas of the paddock. And you can see here the lowest areas are 0.4 up to 0.85. That's as bad as good as you're going to get in this area, this blue area here, and, and that's the poorest area there. So it gives you a bit of an idea of the highs and lows for that particular day. Um, if you want to do some rapid zoning, I mean, there's a range of other software to do this, but on here you can, it auto creates three zones for you. So on that image date, you click zone VRT and that separates this that image into three zones, which is what we did on Trent's place. Um, you simply add the rates, you know, might have 1700 kilos here and 2000 kilos here and 3,000 kilos here, well, it tells you um, how many kilos of product you need. And we just charge a, a small fee to get those 
Um, that's a per hectare fee. But once you pay for that, you get the file, which, which has all those rates embedded. And um, yeah, that goes through to pretty much any machine. Uh, on Friday, like I said, we'll be talking to all the manufacturers. So listen in for them about how to take it to the next step with all the manufacturers. But um, that gives you a bit of a snapshot overview of, of what, um, what, how you can get access to, to free data straight away just to get started on this whole journey. Um, yeah, feel free to get in and, and use that. Any problems, send us an email. Um, so that pretty well covers everything uh, we needed to cover today. Um, for uh, any, any more questions, feel free to send them through. Um, I'd like to thank again GRDC for funding these workshops. I uh, really appreciate them um, putting the effort in to actually get this in front of growers. And I, I really appreciate the growers' time, Trent, uh, Peter, and um, I really appreciate you giving up uh, time of a very busy schedule at the moment to, to join us. Um, it makes a world of difference to hear directly from growers rather than from experts all the time. And I think that's that's been much appreciated. All the other workshops have run exactly the same really, really well. And we appreciate you, you, you spending that time with us. Um, at the end of this, when we end the webinar, there will be a link for an evaluation. If you can please fill in that link, uh, that really helps us get feedback on what's, what's useful for you. So if you can um, do that at the end of the webinar, that'd be great. Thanks very much again for, for joining us and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.